back in town once again, and I'm here for the rest of the summer, so it's good to be back. Um, quick little thing, I think our mic, who knows, maybe our mic packs are going bad. They're old, they could be just having interference. So if anybody would like to donate and buy ourselves a mic pack, we'd love to have your donation. So just a little plug out there for that. Um, as we start today, we are starting our sermon series. We're going to be walking through the book of Philippians. Um, if you're not familiar with this book of Philippians, if you go to the back of your Bibles, it's in the back, like, probably eighth of your Bible. It's just a small little uh, book, probably about two pages long. It's pretty quick to read. We're going to cover it for the rest of the summer. And to start things off this morning, I just want to give you a little background on the book of Philippians so you kind of know uh, who's writing it, who it's being written to. So as we walk through it, you have a better understanding of the intent of what Paul's trying to say. Uh, this book, we call it a book. It was actually originally a letter, just a short little letter to this church um, in uh, Philippi. It is written by a man named Paul, who's the Apostle Paul. Uh, he's the guy that met Jesus on the road to Damascus. He was a, uh, a someone who persecuted the church that was actually killing Christians. Uh, Jesus met him. He becomes a believer in Jesus Christ, and he becomes the greatest evangelist of the early church. And Jesus uses him to take the uh, message of Jesus Christ to all the Gentile world throughout Europe um, and throughout the Middle East back in that time. Uh, he writes this in about 61 AD is where they have pinpointed, uh, pinpointed it. And at the time he writes this, he is actually under house arrest. So Paul is actually in Rome, and he is under house arrest. Philippi, which is the church he started that they call the Philippians. If you show the next picture here, uh, it's where that red marker is. You can see there's Turkey and it's on Greece, um, which on, on the uh, Mediterranean Sea there. It was a very wealthy Roman town. It was a Roman colony. The people in Philippi would have been very similar to us as Americans and the lifestyles we live, even though it was a different time. Uh, what they would have had at that time, they were part of the Roman Empire while the Roman Empire was at its height of power. Uh, so it was very prestigious to actually be part of the Roman Empire. These are people who embrace that, and they had a lot of pride in being known as Romans, the same way we would if we walked around going, we're Americans. Uh, they had a lot of pride in that. And like I said before, they were fairly wealthy. There wasn't a whole lot of poor people in this city. Uh, they were very well-to-do and living a fairly comfortable lifestyle. Um, so even though they were living in comfort, they did have to deal with hostility towards Christianity. Um, this is obvious now as you look at Paul, who's actually under arrest in Rome because of his Christianity. Uh, the persecution in Philippi wouldn't have been quite as bad as it was in Rome, but it was something that was always something in society that people did not really appreciate the Christians and their beliefs and their lifestyles. Um, that it was somewhat hostile towards them. Uh, what Paul does with this letter to the Philippians, he's writing them for two purposes. Uh, number one, he writes them to thank them for money they gave him. Uh, what happens is he's under house arrest, meaning he got to rent his own house and kind of live in his own house, but he couldn't travel anywhere. So he had to stay there, and if he left the house, armed Roman guards would follow him to make sure he didn't go anywhere that he wasn't supposed to go to. So he couldn't really earn a living, so the only way he could rent a house is people sent him money. The Philippians, uh, the people in Philippi, happened to be one of the churches that sent him a gift to help pay for his rent of this house while he was under house arrest. So first he writes them to say, thank you, thanks for sending me money. Number two, he writes them to instruct them and to encourage them. Uh, he is the guy that started this church. He is kind of their, their Christian father in the faith. So he writes them to kind of say, thank you, and here's some encouragement, here's some instruction for you as you live. So over the next several weeks, what we're going to do as a church throughout the summer here, we're going to look at those encouraging things and those instructions that he gives to the Philippians that are just as much true for us as they were to the Philippians 2,000 years ago in 61 AD, all right? Uh, before we get started with that, though, I'm going to cover a couple of different little issues or topics. And the first one is this. I'm going to show you a picture of a guy. Now, I don't know how to pronounce his name, so I'm going to say this for your enjoyment because you all love hearing me try to pronounce things that I haven't seen before or can pronounce. So, um, this is a guy's name, Kagandura Papa Magar. Right? Dead on. That has to be how it's pronounced. Exactly. If I went over to Nepal right now where he lives, he would be like, oh, that's my name perfectly, Scott. How did you do that? And I'd be like, I don't know. I'm just a natural. So, anyways, um, that is him. And here's what I want you to guess. He is the... The kid right here in the pictures, how old would you guess he is? Give me an age. Throw some ages out. Three. Forty. What? Forty-three. What? One month. Okay. Here's how old it is. This guy, we'll call him Mr. Magar. 
Uh, in this picture, he's 24 years old, okay? He stands two feet, two inches tall, and he weighs 13.2 pounds, okay? And he's 24. He's fully grown, fully developed. That's as big as he's ever going to get. He was at one time the shortest teenager in the world. Now he's the second shortest human on the planet right now. But in that picture, he's 24 years old, two feet, two inches, 13.2 pounds. Now, and what's amazing is you look at that picture, we instinctively know something. And what we instinctively know is something's not normal in that picture. We understand a 24-year adult is not supposed to be two feet, two inches tall and weigh 13.2 pounds. We just instinctively know that something's not right. Now, the other question I have for you, this one. How many of you have heard of the Zika, Zika virus? Okay, everybody's heard of the Zika virus. If you haven't, I don't know where you've been for the last like six months. But uh, the Zika virus, just so you know, it started in Brazil with the Olympics going there. Everyone's concerned about this. It's spread by mosquitoes. Um, as they bite a person that's infected with it, and then they go bite someone else, and then you get infected with it. Just so you know, if you actually get infected with the Zika virus, it's basically, from the research I could tell, it's kind of like a mild flu that lasts for five to seven days. Um, it's actually not really that big of a deal if you contract this virus. And once you contract it once, I don't believe you can get it again because your body builds the antibodies uh, to fight it off the second time. So it's not a huge deal. But here's why you all know of it and why it's become such a huge story. Um, it is linked to causing microcephaly within babies of pregnant women. And what microcephaly is, it's a virus that causes babies' heads to come out underdeveloped when they're born and smaller than they should be. Here's some pictures to give you an idea of what happens. Uh, this top picture up here is the normal size of a head of a baby. Someone that has a microcephaly, the second picture shows you, it has like a dotted line if you can see it from where you are, that shows the normal size, shows you the size of a kid born with microcephaly. This is an extreme case, shows you how big their head is, which is literally only about 50% the size of a normal head of an infant. Um, here's some real life pictures. You can just see them. Can you tell their heads are just like, it's almost like half their head at the tops is cut off from a normal head. Their face and their eyes are all about the same size, but their heads are actually like missing anywhere from about 20% to 50% of their head and their skull. Um, it's still formed with the skull and all. It's a smaller and they have smaller brains. And what happens is this leads to several different issues, development issues that last for their lifetime. Um, so it can be educational issues. It can be um, some of them have uh, seizures and stuff like that. There's all sorts of different issues associated with this just because their brains are actually smaller than the normal uh, adult's brain. Now, as you look at those pictures, what you notice is this. Something isn't right about them. I wouldn't even have to tell you about Zika. I wouldn't have to tell you about microcephaly. I wouldn't have to tell you any of that. I just put those pictures up and go look at those pictures, and you would instinctively know something's not right, something's not normal, and it would concern you, what is wrong with that baby? Something hasn't grown right. That's not how they're supposed to come out. Today, in the first part of Paul's letter, uh, what we're going to see to the Philippians is he addresses a topic of spiritual growth. Okay, that's what he's going to address in chapter 1 here, the first part of it, is Paul wants to make sure that we are growing spiritually. He wants to make sure that we have uh, that we become all that God intended us to be in our faith in Jesus Christ. He wanted to make sure that we were growing. Paul wants us to understand that it was expected that we grow in our faith. Um, and he wanted us to also know that if we are not growing in our faith, that it's something that we should realize is wrong with us and we should have concern over it because we're not growing the way we should. Uh, see, Paul understood something and a, a specific temptation that people of Philippi faced, and it's the same one we face, and it's this, comfort. Uh, Paul knew these people were going to be dealing with the temptation of comfort in their lives, and he knew this, that comfort kills growth, and comfort kills spiritual growth. You see, we all want to get into a comfort zone. Uh, we consider getting to a comfort zone like the beautiful place, right? Don't we? Most of our lives, we try to get to that place that's comfortable. We know what's going on. Things are running the way we want them to run, and we look for a comfort zone. But Paul knew that nothing ever grows there. Nothing ever grows in a comfort zone. So he knew the temptation was going to be, you have money, you have privilege, things go well for you. You can get really comfortable, but I want you to know you can't live there in the comfort zone because you will never grow spiritually. 
So we're going to look at what Paul has to say about spiritual growth. Here in chapter 1, if you have your Bibles with you, otherwise it'll be up on the screen or it's on the front of your program. Uh, chapter 1, verses 9 through 11 this morning. And here's how Paul starts it out. He says this. He says, I pray that your love will overflow more and more. So the, he starts it right off and he says this. I pray that your love would grow. That your love that you once had would continue to grow as a follower of Christ. He says, I pray that your love would overflow more and more and that you would keep on growing in knowledge and and understanding. Now see, Paul makes a key connection here between two things. Uh, he connects growth with understanding knowledge, understanding and knowledge, that they go hand in hand and they are connected, that the only way you can grow in your love is you have to be growing in your understanding and your knowledge of Jesus Christ. Um, he's also saying, basically, you can't become more loving if you are not growing spiritually. Okay, You can't become a more loving person if you are not growing spiritually. Now, let me tell you why that's true in Paul's perspective and in a Christian perspective. Um, Love is much more than having a simple emotion for someone or being a support for someone or a cheerleader for them. All right? Um, That is a simple view of love in our culture. What our culture tells you is this is love. This is how you love someone. You either have an emotional feeling towards them or you become a cheerleader for them. And whatever they do, you cheer them on and you become their supporter and you're loving them. So no matter what the actions are, whatever it is, the worst thing you can do, the most unloving thing you can do to someone that you have interaction with is to tell them they're doing something wrong or to try to correct them on anything. In our society today, that is taboo. You can't do that. The way that you are perceived as loving in our culture today is this. Whatever your friend does, whatever your family member does, whatever your associate does, You cheerlead them, and you tell them how great they are and how much you love them. And if you do that, you are showing love. But I want you to know biblically and in real life, that's not really love. That's a very basic uh, form of love. What true love is this. True love is helping people actually improve their lives by knowing and honoring God. That's what true love is. True love is helping people know and understand how to honor God with their lives. Why? Because you are teaching them how to honor their creator, which is truly loving them, how to get their life in conformity with God's desires. Now, to do that, you have to be able as a person to discern God's will. You have to be able to discern his ways. You have to be able to discern his desires, meaning God's. So as you grow in your knowledge and understanding of God's ways, you are better able to truly love people. Does that make sense? If you are not growing and understanding how God works, what God wants, what God's will is for people's lives, you can't truly love someone. All you can do is be a cheerleader for them, but you can cheerlead them into the pit um, of danger, hell, uh, bad things, whatever you want. You can cheerlead them into a whole bunch of horrible things. It's only as you grow as a Christian that you can start going, I can truly love someone more and more because I know how to better instruct them of how to honor God with their lives. I know how to connect them to God in greater ways and in a more effective way. And through that, you truly start to love people more and more, as Paul says here. Your ability to truly love others will grow as you grow spiritually. They are two eternally connected Things. Let me tell you why again. If you are not growing in your understanding and worship of God and your relationship with God, okay, what will happen is this. You become more and more self-focused. Life becomes more and more about you. When you are growing spiritually, life becomes more about who? Him and others. Okay? If you are a longer-term Christian here, you know this. Uh, The more you grow spiritually, the more you think about how God wants you to act towards others. When you are not growing spiritually, you start to worry more about your life and what's going on with you and how you need to fix things and control things. Is that not true? How many of you have experienced that? Okay. We see it played out every day of our lives. We see that. So to truly love people more, the only way to do that and to grow your love is you have to grow your spiritual maturity and you have to grow spiritually in your understanding of God and you will become more outwardly focused, able to help people, and truly be able to love them. All right? Paul carries on in verse 10. He says this, For for what I want you to understand 
Uh, for I want you to understand what really matters. Now, let me stop for a second. This is a direct thing that he knows the temptation they face, which is comfort. Because when you are comfortable, it distorts things that you think really matter. If you look at your own life and you live comfortably, there are things that you think that matter that don't really matter. But you deceive yourself and you distort it into thinking that does really matter because you're comfortable. So Paul says here, it's very interesting, he says, for what I want, for I want you to understand what really matters, things that really matter in life. He says, so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ return. You see, through spiritual growth, we better understand what matters in this life. We better understand what matters in our lives. As we grow spiritually, our pursuits in this life will change. Uh, the things that I consider important and I pursue now as a 20-year-old Christian, and I'm 40 age-wise, but I'm just 20 as a Christian, okay? As a 20-year-old Christian, the things I pursue and consider valuable now are completely different than the things I did when I was a two-year-old Christian. Um, as God has grown me, as I've grown in my relationship and my understanding and my knowledge of Jesus Christ and what he desires for my life and what he desires for all of our lives, my passions, my pursuits, the things I consider valuable drastically change. Um, so as you grow spiritually, you will see this. As Paul says here, I want you to understand what really matters. The only way you get there is you grow spiritually. Uh, we can start to discern not just between what's right and wrong as we grow. The basic understanding for Christians, as you grow is this, you can start to define what's right and what's wrong. Okay, this is basic Christianity 101. You can go, this behavior is wrong, this behavior is right. This behavior is wrong, this behavior is right. That's very basic understanding and very basic um, um, growth in your spiritual life. What happens as you grow beyond that is this. You start to be able to learn to discern between things that are not harmful that I would consider are neutral. They're not, they don't do anything good for you. They don't produce anything good. They're just not bad. First things that are good, first things that are better, versus the things that are the best. Okay. And as you grow spiritually, what you will notice is the things you start pursuing are not the things that are wrong, not the things that are no harm and neutral, not even the things that are good. You start to be able to pursue the things that you know are better and best. And the things that you spend your time on are the things that are the better and the best things that accomplish the most bang for your buck or bang for your time. You get the most payoff for, for the kingdom of God. Instead of these things over here, when we're young and we're not growing, what a lot of things are is this. It's not wrong, so it's okay, and I'm just going to do it, and I'm going to pursue it. And you can spend a lot of your time doing a lot of things that have no harm, but they don't really benefit you or anybody else. They're just time killers. As you grow spiritually, as Paul says here, you'll start to figure out the things that are best, the things that really matter. You'll start to pursue the things that have big payoffs. You'll have start to pursue the things that really change lives, that are worth you spending your time and your effort giving your life to as you mature in your faith, as you grow in your faith. So Paul is encouraging you again to grow there. He then wraps it up with this. He says, so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ returns. Now I want to hit on this point for a second. When you read that phrase, most of you right now are thinking this, when Jesus returns and collects everybody up, right? Second return, the second coming. How many of you thought that when you read that? Okay, that's how we mostly read it. We read that, and when it says right here, so that we, uh, so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day Christ returns, we think when He returns. Now, here's a problem with this, and this is where we get a little lax. It's where we get in our comfort zone. Here's where we get apathetic. As we read that, and we go, it's been two thousand years, and He hasn't returned yet. I've got plenty of time. Let me also tell you what that is: the day of Christ's return. The day of Christ's return. For most of us, if not all of us, could pretty much end up the day you die. Because the day you die, you're going to meet Christ. That will be the day of his return in your life. So don't think you see that as just the second coming that might happen someday. That could be when you die. And we live in a world right now, last night, there's a club. How many of you have seen that already? There's a club that looks like a terrorist hit. 20 people were shot. There's like 47 already injured. Um, 20 people are facing Jesus this morning. Um, a few weeks ago before I left on vacation, uh, there's a teacher up in Owasso, one of the teachers I think of the seventh grade center, was coming up to the construction zone on 169, and somebody was on a phone behind her, and she had stopped in traffic, 
and they were still going 65, and they plowed into the back of their car and killed her, injured both of her children, um, and she's gone. Her second coming of when Jesus returned was that day, that moment. Okay? The second coming, don't get lax thinking, oh, it's something way off in the future. The return of Christ is the day you die. Some of us might be here when he returns. Most likely, we're all going to meet him on the day of our death. And that will be the time that he returns. So don't get lax thinking it's some future event that I don't have to deal with. Yeah, every moment of your day counts. And you need to make sure you're living for the things that really matter. All right? Verse 11, uh, wrapping up this section of scripture, he says this. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. For this will bring much glory and praise to God. So here he talks about the fruit. He talks about the product um, of your salvation. What he means by your salvation is your relationship with God. So what he's saying is the product of your relationship with God, what the product of that is, is that you will develop character that becomes righteous. And what righteous character is, you will develop a character, you'll develop a behavior that is in right standing with God, that follows God's desires for your life. So the product of knowing Jesus Christ in your life will lead to you having a righteous character. And he connects those things. So growing spiritually will develop your character in your life. And then he says this, the purpose of that fruit, okay, the purpose of you growing spiritually, the purpose of you becoming more righteous in your character, the purpose of that is one, not to flaunt it, okay? As you become more spiritually mature and you grow in your faith, it's not there to be used to flaunt other people, go, look at me, look how great I am, and look at you. Okay, That's not why you grow in your faith. It's not there to feel superior over others, to feel like, look at me, I'm such a godly person, and you're a nobody. And I'm so much better. I'm 10 times better than you, and you're a worthless little slug, and I'm really good. And you see this in Christians at times, as they gain knowledge and understanding, they get these attitudes. And Paul's warning you, no, that's not the purpose, that's not the intent of this product in your life. This is not the intent uh, of the fruit of the salvation in your life. It's not there for you to judge others. It's not for you to walk around with a bully pulpit to look at other people and go, you're wrong, you're bad, you're awful. That's not the intent of this righteousness in your life. It's not to feel good about yourself. It's not even to just introspectively look at yourself and go, man, I feel really good about who I am because look how well I'm living. And I'm obeying God the way God wants me to obey. I feel really good. That's not the purpose. It's not to gain you honor. It's not to come to church and have people look at you and go, give you honor and go, that's a really godly person. That's not the intent of why God grows you. Um, it was not even to gain applause from men. It's not to have people notice. This is why God, uh, Jesus talks about when you give to the poor, are you supposed to let it be known to other people you give to the poor? No. When you go and pray, are you supposed to tell other people how much you're praying? No, because he was concerned that you'd be doing it for the applause of man other than to your allegiance to Jesus Christ. So he says, when you give to the poor, you do it on the, so your right hand doesn't know what your left hand's doing. When you pray, you go to a closet and you keep it to yourself. You're not going around to get applause from men. And it wasn't even there to gain salvation. Okay, spiritual growth wasn't there to gain salvation. You already have salvation. You already have a right relationship with God. It's not there to gain salvation. The whole reason that you produce this fruit of righteousness in your life is so you can draw others to God. That's the whole reason. So you can draw others to God. Your spiritual growth is meant to make you more effective at drawing other people to God, which brings him glory and brings him praise. That's why you should desire to grow spiritually, because as you grow to know him more, the more effective you become with the people around you to bring glory and praise to God and for them to see Christ in you. It's all about him. It's not about you. And Paul wanted to make that clear to these people, this gift of salvation, this fruit that you produce as you grow spiritually, it's not for you to get anything. It's to bring him glory and praise. It's about your heavenly father. My question for you this morning as we start to wrap up is this, are you growing spiritually? Um, are you growing the way Paul encouraged the Philippians to grow in their spiritual walk? I would say it this way. Growing is like rowing upstream. Um, if you stop, you start to go backwards. 
That's how spiritual growth works. Um, if you think you're just a neutral, you're not. There is no neutral in spiritual growth. Um, you are rowing upstream. You're rowing against your natural desires, your sinful desires, and you're growing spiritually to compete against those things. If you stop rowing and you start working at it, same way you're on a river that you're going upstream, the minute you stop, what happens? You drift backwards. You don't sit at that same spot like you are in a lake and just sit there. You start to decline. You start to move backwards. Um, so that's how growing works. Growth begins with acceptance, not denial. Um, growth begins when you're able to look at yourself, take an honest look and go, am I growing? Not denying it and trying to come up with excuses saying you are, but you're really not. It's having an honest look at your own life and going, am I growing spiritually? And I think if any of us would just take the minute to stop, to reflect on our lives and really ask that question, I think we would get an honest answer for ourselves to know if we're growing or not. I can tell you the times I'm not, and if I took some time to look at it, I'd be going, yeah, I haven't been growing spiritually for six months. There's other times I'm growing that I know, oh, yeah, I'm growing because I'm pursuing the things of God. I'm doing the things that I know that will help me grow, um, and I can see those things in my life. If, if we're willing to accept the truth about us and not be in denial, we can evaluate truthfully if we are growing as individuals or not in our faith in Jesus Christ, all right? And the last thing I would encourage you is this. Don't be afraid of growing slowly. Um, just be afraid of standing still. A lot of times people make this mistake. I have to see, to consider myself growing, I have to see huge leaps and bounds happening in my life. And if I see those things, I'm growing. And if I don't see those things that are just little things, then I'm not really growing. Let me be honest with you. Most of the time you grow in your Christian faith, they're small little steps. They're just small little things that are happening. Now, we have two kids this week. I got baptized. So Kendall's up here. And um, where's Christina? Christina's there. So these two just got baptized two days ago. So you can give them a hand. So it was a commitment they made to Christ. But what's interesting, and I'm going to point you two out for a second. Not just, just, this happens to all of us. We're all this way. They've given their lives to Jesus Christ. They've been baptized. They've committed to live for Jesus, okay? And they I, now everything's on Facebook, so everything's public now. So you get to see this stuff. So you get to see what these two girls write on their Facebook. And what you write is profound stuff about what Jesus has done in their life and why they made this commitment and how it's changed them and profound things. And when we all became believers, most of us went through that same experience where it was like, this is life-changing, it's profound, a new path forward. I'm going to make changes and what we realize pretty quickly is this. When we're in that moment, we think that's how it's always going to be. And then we find out after a little while, no, it's not usually like that. It's usually small little steps. That's usually how it goes. Um, and if it's not small little steps, it's going backwards. And if we go backwards long enough, we drift far away. Okay? It turns into small steps, and we have to make sure we're not scared of that. That's okay that they're small steps. Um, the scary thing is, is when you're standing still and think you're just standing still. Because you're not, you're floating down the river. That's what we have to be scared of. So this morning, I want to see you grow spiritually. Because I know when you are growing spiritually, your love for others will grow. When you're growing spiritually, you will pursue things in life that really matter rather than just little things that are a waste of your time. And when you pursue spiritual growth, you will bring glory and praise to God through the people you influence with your life. So this morning, I want to encourage you, Pursue spiritual growth. Make sure you are growing as Paul here is encouraging the Philippians to grow. Because when you do, you can start to change people's lives and your life also will be changed. Would you pray with me?